Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the service of Holy Communion. Welcome especially to anybody from Penshurst and Fordcombe. And welcome to Lisa, our rector, who's here today. And um, I've got two notices. The first one is that there is a deanery course called Living in Love and Faith. It starts this Thursday. It's for five evenings during Lent. And it's a, a course that looks about identity, sexuality, relationships and marriage and see how that fits into the bigger picture of being a Christian and the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a discussion course, really. There's videos and discussions. It's going to be held in Chiddingstone Causeway Village Hall and uh, you're very welcome to enrol for it. We've probably got about four or five spaces left. The other churches have taken things up so far. So you need to get in quickly. And uh, Miriam Barker, our rural dean, our area dean, is the one to apply to. The other thing is to say that we have John Bell here from the Iona community, Reverend John Bell, as our guest preacher today. So we're very thrilled about that. So welcome to you, John. So we're going to um, stand, or we're, going to, we're standing already, we're going to sing our first hymn. Guide me, O oh thou great Redeemer, number 296. No, that's yours. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. Let's try again. Well, it says 300 on the board, so I better look and see what that one was. Should we go out and come in again? <laughs> Be thou my guardian and my guide. Sorry about that.
So after that prayer for protection from the work of the devil, we're going to continue our service by sitting or kneeling for our time of prayer. May the Lord be with you. I'm going to pray a prayer for Ukraine just as we start our service because we're living in the context of some very evil days. It's the Archbishop's Prayer for Ukraine. O oh God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace. We pray for the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace. We pray for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. And so we pray together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, and on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, to bring us to eternal life. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolving to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with everyone. We'll pray this second of the two prayers together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be that we may act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. So may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand for the Kyrie.
almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading from the New Testament. The New Testament reading is taken from James chapter 1, verse 12 to, verse 12 to 20. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly light, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. This is the word of the Lord. verse 20.
The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during these days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil then led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So, if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. The devil then led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple, if you are the son of god he said throw yourself down from here for it is written he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone jesus answered it says do not put the lord your god to the test <coughs> when the devil had finished all his tempting he left him until an opportune time. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise Christ our Lord. Please be seated. Friends, I'm delighted to be here. Of all the counties in England, this is the one of which I know least. So it has been a pleasure for three days to be in Aylesford, which I believe is also in Kent, and to be here. And I thank Bill for inviting me to preach, and I thank the Stretfield family for hospitalising me yesterday and today. <coughs> no one, when tempted, should say, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil and does not himself tempt anyone. Temptation comes when a person is lured and dragged away by their own desires. This is from the book of James. And I apologise to anyone who is a lectionary fundamentalist that this should have been read today. Because in the lectionary it says the reading for today is about uh, Jacob wrestling with uh, God in the desert. But I was struck with this text which I had never really come across before, from an interesting book. The book of James is one of the books which nobody really wanted to get into the Bible uh, for a long, long time because it's very direct and it's slightly political. And eventually, it was allowed to go into the canon that we call the New Testament. And it's a book whose authorship is unclear. James could be one of Jesus' brothers or James could be the, uh, the disciple called James, or James could be someone else. But whoever wrote the epistle of James is someone who was very close to Jesus and who probably knew him very well. And who therefore would be able, when he said, temptation comes when a person is lured and dragged away by their own desires, would link this to what Jesus only Jesus could say about the temptations in the desert. You see, we know that there were crowds around when he performed miracles. And we know that there were crowds around when he preached in the temple and in the synagogue. But when he was in the desert, there was no one there from either the Daily Mail or any other paper taking notes of what happened. And so when we hear this account of his temptation, it's something which comes autobiographically from his experience. That in the desert, he was being tempted, and he was being tempted not by the devil offering him a night on the tiles, 
but appealing to something much baser or much more profound. I think sometimes that when we can think of temptation, it, it is you know, something which is really quite mild. I remember uh, hearing about a woman in Glasgow who on the f before Ash Wednesday, this is years ago, uh, you'll recognize that when I've fulfilled the story, she felt that it would be important for her to get off her chest everything that was bothering her and all that was tempting her before Lent began. And she being a devout Roman Catholic and the Catholic Church at that time offering confession regularly went before the Eucharist on Ash Wednesday to confess. And when she was in the confession box, they, uh, she said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And she said, and then, Father, and if, I don't, if you don't mind me saying so, I have so much to get off my mind that I've written it all down on a piece of paper. <laughs> and she stuck the piece of paper through the grill in the confession box. And the priest opens it up and he reads, half a dozen eggs, two pounds of sugar, <laughs> half a stone of potatoes. And then he pushes it back through to the lady and said, my dear, I think you've given me the wrong list. And she looked at this and you could hear the horror in her voice and she said, you're dead right, Father, and I think I've just sent my sins to the co-op. <laughs> <laughs> what we are being confronted with in this story is not a trite temptation. What we're being confronted in this story is a temptation such as we do not normally consider. It's on an issue which rarely gets a mention in the church, which we seem to be almost scared of dealing with. The temptations of Jesus have to do with power. Essentially, they have to do with power. The first temptation, he's being asked if, for the purposes of feeling better, he might just turn stones into bread. It's highly personal. It will be to his own self-advantage. And the second temptation is about popularity. If you throw yourself down from the temple, people will see that, that, that the angels will come and rescue you. And well, that will make you famous. And then the third one is about how if only, if only he gives in to Satan, then all the kingdoms of the world would be his. Now Jesus, of course, wants not to be hungry forever. And Jesus, of course, would desire that people acclaimed him. And Jesus would want the whole world to be observant of him and to respect him. And all these things, which he can understand, are good and sensible things, will be given him. If only he uses his power in the way in which the devil is presenting the options. These three temptations to self-aggrandizement, to popularity, and to having an influence over the whole world are not just confined to Jesus. There's someone in the news the past two weeks for whom these things have been very important. If we allow for the term bread to include the more vernacular understanding of it being money, then Vladimir Putin has made a lot of money out of stones. In fact, he's built a lot of palaces probably with the money which he's accrued and which is which had been looked after by his agents elsewhere. And Putin has been very keen to be popular and has whipped up within Russia an expectation that the West wants to invade that country and he alone, he alone is the one who is able to prevent that from happening. And so he boasts in the press which his government controls. And if he does not want all the countries of the world to be at his feet, then certainly those who are in the regions nearby are now pretty scared. I have a friend who phoned me the other day uh, he is a son in Latvia. His wife and he had been weeping for two days in the fear that the Baltic states might be the next to capitulate. Of course, in the West, we look on this with great disgust and fail to see that these imperial designs of Putin 
are only what we have done ourselves in the past. We, in fact, I don't think there are many nations in Europe have not grown rich because of what we plundered in different parts of the world, stones, diamonds, gold, other minerals, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in South Africa, and Brazil. And we might be disgusted that Putin enabled the destruction of a sacred site, Babin Yar, in Kiev, where 150,000 people whom the Nazis had slaughtered are buried. But if you meet people who are First Nations people in North America and Canada, or the Aboriginal people in Australia, they can talk of how their ancient ancestral sites, where the bones of those that revered are buried, have been desecrated by the predations of the British Empire. And as for meddling in another nation's business, taking over a nation, well, the USA, a country which I dearly respect, is not exactly clean. I mean, it's, it's a fairly recent imperial power, but the end of the 19th century, uh, Hawaii, which was an independent kingdom ruled by a queen with no army, was suddenly invaded by America, who decided about 80 years later that they should call it a state. Never would have played the sight of the people. And when 9-11 is mentioned in Chile, it's not because of a disaster in New York. It's because that's the day in which Salvador Allende, the democratically elected uh, prime minister of president of Chile, was deposed and killed with the consent of the USA. And as for Putin preventing this conflict being called a war, well, most of us here in living memory will remember that Ireland, which is probably the only nation in Europe which has never had an empire, was in the turmoil in the north in what now is called a civil war, but until the signing of the Good Friday Agreement was called the Troubles. Mm -hmm. Our hands are not clean, and what Putin is doing with his power is what in the past we have done with ours. And it's important for us to see that when Jesus is tempted by the devil, it's not just a personal thing, it's a public thing. Thrown down from the temple tower and having all the kingdom of the world, this is a temptation to use power in a public sphere for ends which, or means rather, which are altogether evil. The corporate world, whether it be of politics or whether it be of industry, is one which increasingly amasses power to itself. I sometimes am amazed that people who are billionaires, particularly those in America, who have corporations with budgets which are bigger than the size of individual nations, to whom are they accountable for what they do? And who dare not just protest but advise them as to what is the rightful and the wrongful use of of power. We had a little experience of this in Scotland, in the island of Harris, which is one of the Western Isles closest to America. It's right in the periphery of the British uh, Isles. And there was a multinational mining conglomerate who came to the Isle of Harris and they recognised that the stone on a mountain was great stone for road building in other parts of Europe. And so they said to the islanders, we'd quite like to take down this mountain, if you don't mind, and then we'll dig a quarry, which will be the biggest man-made hole in Great Britain, and from that we'll be able to quarry stone and take it for road building all through Europe. And, and it's a great prospect because this will bring jobs into the island and money into the island, and young people who would leave the island and go to Glasgow or Edinburgh will be able to stay in the island because of their employment. And the government in London very sensibly said, well, if you're going to take down a mountain, we should perhaps have a consultation about it. And so they sent a recorder from London to open a discussion on whether this was a good or bad thing. And some people who were hoteliers or who had shops thought, yeah, if trade comes in, it'd be great for the island. And some people didn't take that view. They were people who said, well, if we're going to have 
a mountain moved, our single track roads will be insufficient. I mean, I can imagine in this community, if a mountain were being moved, people might object that a three-lined highway would have to be created where hitherto it's been a small, narrow lane. And if big boats are going to come and take the stone away to the continent, well, we've got a shallow harbour with a roll-on, roll-off ferry. We'll need to have a much, much deeper kind of place where these huge boats can be loaded with stone. And then two people came with a perspective which was not a political perspective, but was to do with the earth and its relationship to its maker. One was a a First Nation American chief called Stone Eagle, who came from a Mi'kmaq nation in Canada. And he spoke of how there was a relationship between humanity on the ground and having seen how a mountain which had been destroyed in his native territories had affected the whole community. He could not face his grandchildren or God if, given the news that this was to happen in another part of the world, he did not go and object. And then a man who was a free church, very conservative Presbyterian pastor and a professor of theology, said how humanity and the ground are linked together. And rape of the land can also be rape of the community. He said the primary function of creation is to serve as a manifestation of the glory of God. And anything which disallows creation from revealing God's glory has to be challenged. And in the end of the day, it was decided that the mountain would not be felled. But it showed that community how the power of a corporation which was able with great rhetorical skill and financial resources to suggest that this move would be good for all could be resisted by people who had a depth of understanding of how humanity and the soil are intimately, by dint of God, linked together. And it's a relationship which cannot easily be despoiled. And all of us, not in the big corporate political realm, but all of us in our own way are challenged, or rather not challenged, encouraged to consider how we use the power which we have. I love reading years and years ago before I ever met the man, how Desmond Tutu loved white people. And it was because when he was a little boy, he was going along the street with his mother. And there was a priest, an English priest called Trevor Huddleston, an English Anglican priest who came along the road and as they past, Huddleston took off his hat and said, good morning, Mrs. Tutu. And that enabled Desmond Tutu to believe that white people were not oppressors. That gesture empowered him to be a person who in later years would radically aid the liberation of black people in South Africa. And I think of how my passion for particularly racial justice is, is, comes from a very simple f- act of refrained, restraint, which my grandfather did when I was 11. And he discovered there was a football team from Rhodesia, as was known. Now it's called Zimbabwe. But it had broken away from Britain, declared Universal Declaration of Independence and wanted a white minority to rule a black nation. And to keep up with the world and not be a pariah state, they decided they'd send the football team to Britain to see if any teams would play. And my grandfather, who I don't think ever had met a black man in his life, but who had supported Kilmarnock football team since the end of the 19th century, decided that he would withhold his ticket money and never go and watch his team again because they were going to play a racist team 
who despised black people. And in that town in Kilmarnock, realising my grandfather was changing what he had done over his whole life because wrong had to be confronted with right. He influenced my brothers and I for good. I sometimes think that these temptations of Jesus were essential in allowing him to realize that sometimes you use power and sometimes you withhold power and you have always to make that decision. If he had changed the stones into bread, I wonder if he ever would have fed the 5,000 people who were hungry. Why not just use your power to satisfy your own desires, to maximize self-aggrandizement and forget what compassion and empathy and charity are all about. If he had used his miraculous powers to jump from the temple top and be caught by angels before the ground, I wonder if he would ever have had the humility in him to sit beside those who others despised and to let those who were presumed to be diseased or morally deficient touch him personally, physically and emotionally and spiritually. I wonder if he had just ascended to the devil and became the lord and master of all that the devil said he could put in his hands. I wonder if he'd ever have been able, at the end of the day, to win the world for God and to show the supremacy of love, not through coercion, but through his suffering on the cross. On this first Sunday in Lent, we're given a glimpse into the inner heart and experience of Jesus, who in the face of what power could do for him, decided to forfeit all personal benefit and instead use the world to heal, use his power to heal the world and its people. And of us, he asks nothing less. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's within that rather awesome context that we stand now to declare our faith using the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's sit or kneel as Hilary leads us in our time of prayer.
Lent has begun in our busy and troubled world. Let us pause in the stillness of this sacred place and listen to God. May we take time to focus on the many gifts bestowed upon us and the sacrifices we intend to make and reflect on his goodness in our lives. May our minds be open to his word and our ears be open to his voice. Lord, hear us. A prayer from Iona for the first Sunday in Lent. Christ of the wilderness and of the crowded street, whispering in the desert and shouting in the market, help us to hear you above temptation's promises. Strengthen us to follow you on the highways of your world. Lord, Hear us. Visit the people of Ukraine and look with compassion, O Lord, upon a nation that is besieged with unprovoked violence and destruction, horror and death. Enter every trembling heart and pour your compassion over the millions whose lives are being torn apart. Bless the children. Bless those who are sheltering. Bless those who have fled their homes. Bless those who are wounded, vulnerable, or too frail to leave. Give strength and courage to those who have remained, the conscripted and the volunteers who endeavour to retain freedom and democracy and the just cause. Ukraine, we share your pain and we weep for you. Lord, hear us. Lord and Prince of Peace, by the power of thy Holy Spirit, quench the passions of arrogance and greed that corrupt the mind and so lead to acts of wickedness and the desire to control. Support and counsel all leaders who are working to secure peace, freedom and justice. We pray that a way may be shown to overcome the desire to destroy and for peace to be restored. May each one of us listen for the still small voice of calm. Lord, hear us. Merciful Father, we thank thee for the extraordinary goodness and generosity shown by so many to those in need. May, may their humanity and acts of kindness remind us that in the midst of tragic darkness, the light of Christ shines through. Lord, hear us. Here in our parishes, we remember the sick. Nancy and Gerald, Roger, Margaret, Jane, Ian, Walter, Chloe, Philippa, and Carol. And in a silent moment, we remember those known to us. We pray for the recently bereaved. Chris with Florence and Oscar, who mourn Emilia and also for Liz and Paul, who mourn their son, Harry. Lord, into thy hands we commend all those for whom we have prayed. Lord, hear us. From our Book of Remembrance, 
On the 7th of March, Basil Everest. On the 8th of March, Winifred Edith Corney. On the 9th of March, Leslie Thomas William Stroud. And also, Jean Grace James. On the 11th of March, Tom Fox. George Gibson. On the 12th of March, June Mary Crooks and Elizabeth Alfreda Lorraine Rawlins. Finally, a prayer for this congregation from St. Columba. Be, Lord Jesus, a bright flame before us, a guiding star above us, a smooth path below us, and a kindly shepherd behind us, today, tonight, and forever. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Lord Christ. Amen. Thank you, Hilary, for leading us in those prayers. And thank you, John, too, for reminding us of our own history. True history, hearing all the voices of history, not just the voice of the victors, is so important to arrive at truth so that we can go forward in peace. Would you like to stand for the peace, please? Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I think I've got the right hymn number. 311. Lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. 
Blessed are you, Lord God, of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. And now we give you thanks because you give to us the spirit of discipline that we may triumph over evil and grow in grace as we prepare to celebrate the Paschal mystery with mind and heart renewed. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. sit on here. Lord, you are holy, indeed the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup and gave you thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death upon the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, we thank you for counting us to be in your presence to serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, 
Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in the one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. And so we pray together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. I'm afraid during these COVID days, the celebrant is the only one able to drink from the cup. One day we'll have the common cup back again. But uh, please do feel free when it comes to communion time to come up and receive the bread. So may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for us, preserve us body and soul unto everlasting life. And may, <clears throat> and may the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> which was shed for us, Preserve us, body and soul, unto everlasting life. We drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for us, and we are thankful. So let us draw near with faith, to receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for us, and his blood, which he shed for us, eating and drinking in remembrance that he died for us, and feeding on him in our hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
So as we draw to near the end of our service together, we're going to sing our closing hymn, hymn number 300, Be Thou My Guardian and My Guide. Sorry. I'm very sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll get better staff next time. Lisa, where are you? 303.
let's sit or kneel for our final prayers. <clears throat> so in the order of service, we pray together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please do thank you for coming to share in the worship this morning. And um, please do stay for tea and coffee after the service. And I'm sure you'll be able to speak to, to John if you wish to then. Otherwise, let us uh, ask God's blessing on us. <clears throat> so may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.